Alright, hello guys, and welcome to this breakdown of the January forecast. We're going to get right into it. Now, I've talked a lot about in the, in the past, like maybe September or October, my process to forecasting, and this is kind of going to be repetition of that. This is going to be me going over that kind of again, and I'm going to break down how it's done uh, by me, uh, the long range and the monthly forecast, because they tend to do quite well, so people are very curious how I do it and what, what the process really is. And this video, I'm going to touch on that a lot, so if you're interested in that, this is a great video for you. Now, we're going to take a look. One of the most important areas is the west coast of the United States, Canada, and then right there by Alaska as well. When we see warmer temperatures there and the sea surface temperatures there, uh, it really means a lot. And, and it's going to really cont contribute to ridging in that area, which would also contribute to possible troughing in the eastern United States. So we like to see that there. You'd like to see a little bit of colder in those, those little pockets of blue. It almost looks like it's kind of just like scattered in there. Uh, you'd like to see that a little bit more consistently cold, uh, but it, it, it doesn't really matter as long as it's, it's kind of cold or neutral like that. Our El Nino obvi obviously looks really interesting. We don't usually see El Ninos that look like this, and this really is looking like a, a west based or Modokai El Nino, or at least basin-wide. A lot of those areas by the coast of the South America and the Central America regions uh, is even looking below average temperatures there for the sea surface and that really means a lot actually the type of El Nino we get so that looks really different than most El Ninos and that's really a good sign that we see most of the warmer waters far off the coast of those areas. Now we're gonna move on to my analogs and how their sea surface temperatures looked and you can kind of compare um, so 2014 to 2015, 1977 to 78, and 2002 to 2003 were my three analogs that I've used throughout the year, and they've tended to, to really do well uh, throughout the months, the fall months, and into the winter months here. You can see the one big difference is that colder pocket there in, the, in that north central Pacific that I talked about, how it's a lot more consistently cold in my analogs, and that's the biggest difference here. The El Nino looks very similar. Uh, where it's really warm as you go further west into the central Pacific. And then that warmer waters up against Alaska, Canada, and the United States is obviously there. So that's really, really consistent. And then the Atlantic looks almost identical as well. So that matches up really well. So I know that these analogs are going to work. Uh, they're, they're some of the best analogs for this month, actually, uh, based on the sea surface temperatures. Now, here's what they showed on the surface air temperature for January. And you're going to see at the bottom it says 2015, it says 2015, 1978, and 2003 now because we're talking about January. That sea surface temperature was taken from December, so I obviously had to use 2014, 1977, and 2002 uh, because that was December. <laughs> now it's January. So we can see that they are calling for warmer temperatures in the western United States and then colder temperatures in the eastern United States. Now, I don't take too much into account how cold it is. Well, I take it that in moderately into account, but the actual location of the coldest temperatures doesn't doesn't mean too much. I'm overall looking, is it cold in the east, warm in the west, warm all over the place, or is it cold in the west, warm in the east? Now, we see that it's cold in the east, warm in the west, and quite strongly, which means that most likely all three of my analogs have this. Now, this means that in my forecast, and you saw in my forecast, that I'm for sure going to call for cold in the east, warm in the west. Uh, so I take this information, and we're going to move on to precipitation uh, in my analogs. And you see they call for above average precipitation, especially up against the eastern United States and northeastern United States. You know, I, I'm not too confident, or I'm not too confident in that area, but... This, the southeastern United States, I think, in the Gulf states will be a lot more above average precipitation than this. And, and really, uh, it, it's quite evident of that. So, yes, I think that there's a good chance that we'll have above average precipitation in the northeastern United States like this is showing. But I think that it will be more so in the Gulf states and then uh, more of a slight, slightly above average precipitation there for the northeastern United States. We're going to move on, and this is where it really you can you know, figure out what you're going to do with your information from your analogs. I got my analogs and now I'm going to see, do the models agree with what my analogs show? You can tell that my priority is in the analogs. The analogs is the number one priority and that's going to weigh the most into my forecast. But if the models do agree, then I have a lot, lot more confidence in my analogs and then that's when I would make a forecast where I'm almost, you know, 90% confident in my monthly forecast. So I like to see the models agree with my analog. If they disagree, I still take my analog over the models, but I kind of lean it towards the models and kind of average it out. 
models don't mean as much as analogs do to me. Uh, the CFS has a known warm bias, so what I like to do is actually look at the 500 geopotential height and anomalies instead of the temperature. Uh, and I really like to see where these black, what these black lines do. They're going to show me where the ridges and the troughs are. And that's really what's important here, especially with a uh, kind of ensemble model. It's really crucial to look at things like this. We can tell where it tends to put the troughs and where it tends to put the ridges. You can see these black lines ridge in the west and they trough in the east. So I know that this is leaning towards troughing in the east and leaning towards ridging in the west. So this is a pretty good look here. And this is for January again, obviously. And, and then we're going to look at our ECMWF EPS. So this is the ensemble model of the European model. And everybody knows the European model is the best uh, model out there, at least medium range model. Uh, so really we're going to look at this in seven day increments because this is how the model works. The model doesn't have a 30 day increment that you can actually look at. You'd have to make that on your own. And I didn't want to go through the time. So I'm just going to show you seven day increments. Now to start January, uh, it does have warmer in the southeastern United States, colder in the west. We kind of know this is how it's going to be. So this is from uh, the 31st of December to the 7th of January. So the first week of January, this is how it looks. And it really, I think this is going to be a lot of warm in that first half of that time period. And then really, it's going to start to get cold there towards the end. But it's going to look like this overall. And as we move on to the next week, that's when our cold really arrives for the east. And you can see it's, again, this is 7th to the 14th. Uh, and we can see the transition is happening and we see that warmer temperature there for Montana, North Dakota. That's where I'm calling for warmer temperatures as well. So you see that kind of pouring on into there. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with all that cold in the West. Uh, this model does show that a lot. I've noticed over the last few months and it does pan out sometimes, but sometimes it just calls for it and then it doesn't end up happening. So that's a known bias right now that I know of uh, that does call for colder temperatures for those regions. Uh, we're going to move on to the 14th to the 21st, and you can see it kind of we get a thaw out again for the east, and, and it really starts to show the southeast a little bit above average, maybe or near average, and then the west cold again. And I buy this; I think that there will be thaws throughout. This won't be our coldest month, I don't think. And, and then you can see by the 24th to the 31st to end January, we have the cold moving back into the east. And might I mention that beyond this, it does show a cold February for the east and warm for the west, so it's leaning towards that right now. I just wanted to mention that. So that's what the ECMWF model shows. And, and as you go further into that one, it's not quite as accurate as some of the other models. Um, but again, that's where analogs are a lot more accurate than models because models aren't quite reliable at 800 hours. We know this. Now, looking at the GEFS, so this is the GFS ensemble model. This one doesn't go out quite as far. This one only goes out to like the first week of January. But you can see by the 6th, it is calling for cold in the east, warm in the west, like my forecast shows. So this does mean that, at least at first, it, this is calling for this. And, and by the 11th here, you can see it's really pouring on the cold for the east, and it's warm in the west. So this is a really good sign for my forecast to verify. And I really like what I'm seeing from the models to really... Uh, match up with my analogs quite well so um, we're gonna look at Noah's forecast here and, and I mentioned this in a previous video this is actually one of the first Noah forecasts that actually lines up really well with my forecast usually I don't agree with them too much or they don't agree with me vice versa uh, and it ends up not looking the same I don't look at these before I make my forecast I, I really see these afterwards uh, just to see like, oh, what is Noah calling for? Are they seeing what I'm seeing? Basically that type of thing. And in this case, I think they are seeing what I'm seeing. Uh, it's quite evident because this looks very similar to my temperature forecast. So what I'm seeing, they are also seeing, or I'm seeing what they're seeing. So yes, I, I like this forecast and I think it'll verify quite well. Uh, as we move on to the next slide, it's acting up. Apologize. I wanted to show you one more thing. We see our snowfall forecast according to the ECMWF model uh, for the month of January. And if you go to BennellWeather.com, uh, you can see that on the bottom right. You can you can access this this little tool here. People have been asking about this, uh, and and you can see in that blue we have above average snowfall uh, according to the ECMWF. So for Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware. These areas are all above average snowfall. Uh, and that's where they have the above average precipitation and the below average temperatures. So it's quite evident that th that's how it would be. But I just wanted to mention that because that is where I'm calling for above average snowfall as well. So that, that definitely contributed a lot. Just 
the fact that there should be above average precipitation and below average temperatures usually means that you're matched up pretty well to get to get above average snowfall. That's that's the only way you can make a an, a semi accurate snowfall forecast for a month. It's really hard to do anyway, and it's not not very accurate usually. Uh, but I like to put it out there, put my best guess out there, just in case that information could be useful to somebody. Uh, and there's a moderate chance that it verifies anyway. Uh, and, and I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a bonus here. This is the February ECMWF snowfall f anomaly forecast here. And you can see it, it looks a lot of the same. And, and we're really looking at, I think, as of right now, it's, it's very early to talk about February. I think that February will be colder than January for the East. And I really have always thought this, according to my analogs, uh, since the beginning of my winter forecast, I've always thought that February would be the coldest month for the eastern United States, and I'm still standing by that. January should be quite good, but I, I do think February is really going to be the, the better month out of the two for sure. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this breakdown. Let me know what you thought. Go ahead and make sure to leave comments down below what you thought. Uh, like the video, and make sure to subscribe as well if you enjoyed the video. I'll see you guys later. Have a great January.